Hey, boomers. 40% of Americans have a hard time swallowing pills. So when it's time to take your vitamins, large capsules and pills are out of the question. I certainly don't like those. So we know gummy vitamins exist, but they're full of sugar. They get stuck in your teeth, and they only contain a fraction of the nutrients that you need. Luckily, Easy Melts has discovered the ultimate vitamin sweet spot, vitamins that melt in your mouth, taste like a treat, and are packed with nutrients ready for absorption, all without an ounce of sugar. For a limited time, Easy Melts is giving Hey Boomer listeners a free three-month supply of vitamin D3 with your first purchase. To claim your free D3, visit trytry.ezmelts.com slash heyboomer. Say goodbye to the old way of taking your vitamins and hello to the easy way. Well, hello and welcome to the Hey Boomer Show, the show for those of us who believe that we are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. My name is Wendy Green and I am your host for Hey Boomer. And it's a good thing we have a doctor on the show today. I had a little accident this past Thursday. I caught my finger in a car door. And not only did I cut it badly, I also broke it. And the pain was more than I can describe. Um, I was going into Costco at the time and ended up on the floor in Costco because of the pain. And um, yeah, it's not something that I would recommend. And so now I am learning to do things one-handed And I also am grateful for my friends who have come by and helped, um, particularly Doris, who brought me coffee and scones and kept me company for a little while so that I could not think about the pain. But, you know, things change in a second, right? We, We get distracted. We take our mind off what we're doing. And that's when an accident happens. And yes, it's called an accident. But as we age, we don't process quite as fast. And so it's more likely that we're going to have accidents. And we're going to talk to Dr. David Bernstein about that, as well as many other things. He has written several books that we'll talk about and get his perspectives on how to live a long and healthy and fulfilling life. But before we get to Dr. Bernstein, I always like to talk to you about Road Scholar. You know Road Scholar is my favorite way to travel. And Road Scholar has trips to over, well, to over 100 countries around the world and to all 50 states in the United States. It is the not-for-profit leader in educational travel for boomers and beyond and for grandparents and grandchildren. So go ahead if you are thinking about travel and check out their website. Go to road, R-O-A-D, scholar.org slash heyboomer. And please use the slash heyboomer because it lets them know that you heard about Road Scholar Travel from the Hey Boomer Show. And while you're here, I also want to encourage you to download the Life Vitality Assessment from the Hey Boomer website, heyboomer.biz. It will give you some insight into how vital you are feeling at this stage of your life. Maybe you're feeling fully vitalized, like you're ready to take on anything. Maybe you have sustained energy that you're getting from some of the work and activities that you're involved in. Or maybe your cup is kind of half empty, you know, and there's things that you want to do, but you just can't seem to get up and do them. Or maybe it's time to take stock and think about what it is that you need to change or to add 
to get back that feeling of vitality that is so important to us as we age. So download the vitality assessment. It's on the homepage of heyboomer.biz. And if you'd like to talk further about it, you can schedule some time with me on my Calendly link. I will put that in the show notes and let's talk. So with that, let me bring on Dr. Bernstein. Hi, David. Hi, Wendy. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's wonderful to see you today, all intact and ready to go. <laughs> Fingers and all. Glad to have you here. Let me give them a brief overview, a bio, short bio about you. So Dr. Bernstein is an award-winning physician and author who is board certified in both internal medicine and geriatrics. He retired about three years ago from his practice in Clearwater, Florida. But as we talk about here on Hey Boomer, does, retirement doesn't mean that he stopped. So his 40 years of experience have provided him with opportunities to observe and empathize with thousands of adults as they age. He's integrated his experience with them and in his practice and written several books. One book, that I read is called, I've got some good news and bad news. You're old. <laughs> These are tales of a geriatrician. What to expect in your 60s, 70s and 80s and beyond. And then he has written something called The Power of Five, The Ultimate Formula for Longevity and Remaining Youthful. And there's also a journal that goes along with that. Dr. Bernstein is a graduate of Albany Medical College an associate clinical professor of the Department of Medicine at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. And he is our guest. So glad to have you today. So let's start by talking about accidents and safety. When I um, did the technology check with you, you talked to me about the way we process things differently as we age and why um, accidents are more likely to happen and how to stay safe? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I think uh, there are some things that we can do to make our lives longer and healthier. And I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about it. But something that often goes unspoken is the uh, impact of being responsible for our safety. And that means driving safety, it means after 65, avoiding ladders, don't go up on the roof, hire someone to clean your gutters, because you can change your life in a snap with an accident like that. All the plans that you have to take a road scholar trip and travel with your grandparent, grandkids, and do some of those fun things really get disrupted if you break your leg, if you break your arm, especially men who do some of these things, they, they, they um, try to stabilize themselves with putting out their right arm and they break their arm, which means <clears throat> some of the daily functions that we do, some of the things that, Wendy, you found out about breaking a finger on your right hand, you can't do as well. That's you right. Write, you can't bathe and groom, and some of those things get really <laughs> difficult. And they're preventable. And I think the other point that you raise is that we need to take our time to be conscious of what we're doing all the time and being and living in the present. So thinking about, I'm going to Costco, I have my list, it's in my pocket. I'm not thinking about who I got to call later. The next podcast is just being in the moment it will often help prevent some of those unfortunate un uh, accidents, as you call them. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I told you this, I was surprised at how wiped out I was. I mean, it was just a finger. And it took me two days of being exhausted and tired and nauseous to get over it. Like, what was that about? Well, there's the pain associated with that and the draining process and the release of adrenaline and cortisol, things that are adv advantageous if you need to fight a saber-toothed tiger, but disadvantageous if you have to deal with all the uh, repercussions of slamming your finger in the door, breaking your finger and bolsing your nail. And, oh my goodness, it's this day of the week and how am I going to get it taken care of? And all of that just drains the energy out of you. 
Yeah. So another reason for preventing those kind of events. And, you know, there's other people who have something similar. We'll spend six hours in an emergency room and they'll be among people who might come in with respiratory infections and things that are contagious. So, so there's all kinds of reasons why uh, being safe and, and avoiding what you went through um, is helpful. Yeah. So slow down, be present with what you're doing. So, um, David, what do you think is one of the biggest health issues that faces us as we age? Well, um, everything I did um, in my writing when I would sit down would always be directed at baby boomers, my high school classmates. So I'm, this is right in my wheelhouse about things that, that affect us and, and what we can do. And, and we have control over our lifetime and life expectancies and our health span. It's all within the palm of our hand. And we just have to recognize and do it. And, and that's where my power of five, five S's come in. If I'm addressing your question properly, it's things we have control over. So we have control over what we eat, how much we exercise, how much we sleep, how we address stress, and uh, how we connect with people. And they're all things that take intention, they take understanding, and they take the fact that it's never too late to start doing these things. I like that. It's never too late. So you have an acronym, Aging with Grace. And um, I think the G that you have in Grace is probably my favorite. So why don't we start by unpacking that acronym and let's start with G. Sure. And and I really didn't consider them focus groups, but I was invited to speak in our community many times. And between those events and my patients, I asked them, what were the secrets to their longer life and their happiness and their success in life? And people would raise their hands and I would hear uh, the, the sort of the same things over and over again. And, and I identified five and I like the number five because people like can remember five. five things, five fingers <laughs> five in your hand. fingers. Well, four and a half in your case, but <laughs> five fingers in your hand and five family members and five players on my favorite sport, basketball. So, I, and, and one of my professors said, you know, people, even doctors can only remember five things. So don't <laughs> give people any more instructions in five. Come back tomorrow and give five more if you want. <laughs> So that That's had a good. major impact on, on what I put together. And then I, I said, I want to make an acronym. So I came up with those things. And, and the first letter of G was goals. Grace starts with G. So having goals or a purpose in life is one of the things that's just uniformly present in people who had those long, healthy, happy lives. And it doesn't mean that... Um, just because you retire that you hang everything up and don't do anything. But you could always set new goals or have a purpose in your lives. And, and there were people who I evaluated as my patients who just were these great examples. And, and one of my favorites was uh, a gentleman who managed some real estate in New York City and moved to Florida. And um, I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I work as a security guard at the historic uh, Clearwater Hotel. And I said, oh, really? Why do you do that? He says, well, um, it's enjoyable. I, I meet friends. I meet people that I, I work with that are very enjoyable to be with. Um, I have this very beautiful drive to and from the hotel. It's about 20 minutes. And I see palm trees. I see the sunrise or the sunset. And, and it gives me something to get up and do. And, uh, and in addition, he said, you know, if I had to spend my whole day with Edna, one of us would end up in a grave and the other one would end up in prison, <laughs> meaning they'd kill each other. So yeah. having, having a purpose, having something to do um, was an important part of his life. And, and he made himself res responsible for things at the hotel where he, he was a security guard. And he, I remember him telling me, he said he caught some people trying to steal things and to report things that weren't that might have been stolen from their room, but they weren't. So um, he felt that he was making a difference, and that was incredibly important. And he lived well into his 90s, and he was still alive and kicking when I retired. Yeah, I think that is ultimately an important part of living 
a fulfilling and healthy life. Um, I think that uh, the other day I was out for my walk and I ran into a neighbor who is 83 and he had a remarkable recovery from cancer. And he said one of his main things that he think kept him going was to feel like every morning he had a reason to get up out of bed. So having that purpose. Unquestionably, and, and even before that, going through chemotherapy or whatever treatments he had to go through, he had to know that there was life after all of those treatments. And, and that's something that gets people going because if people don't have a purpose in life, they, they give up. Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about that a lot on the show. So the R is probably my least favorite because it seems like the one that we have less control over. And you talked about control. So how do you explain R for your roots? I explain it in two different ways. One is your DNA and your roots. And there are two things you can do with your roots. By the way, the roots, your DNA contributes only 20 to 25 percent of your life expectancy. The other 75 to 80 percent is up to you. So okay, it's only a right. small part, but it is an important part. And if you have bad genes and you know it, do something about it. If you know that obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease run in your family, then don't wait until you're 50 and 60 and 70 to do something about it when all they can do is put in stents and bypasses, but start doing things early. And I did start writing my books when I was in my 50s. So addressing my, my high school classmates and baby boomers was, was appropriate at the time, but it's never too early. It's never too late to start making those changes. The other part of roots, and maybe I'm, I'm digressing a bit, and maybe it has to do with the leaves on the tree, but <laughs> it's your family. <clears throat> it's how you interact and how you know who you're, what your family tree is all about. And, and that's connections within your family. But truly, it's what you can do to make your health better. And, and the opposite of, of having bad genes is when you have good genes. If you have good genes, take care of them. Don't be going to fast food and eating processed foods and, and not exercising and sitting on the couch and taking advantage of your good genes because so they'll let you down. Um, and, and the other thing about it is that we can always make some changes. And getting back to the safety issue, if you know you have good genes, don't take advantage of them. Don't go doing things that put you at risk, like slamming your finger in the door, like going on the roof and going on ladders. I've seen enough accidents happen in people's homes that have a major impact on them by doing foolish things and not thinking of safety. It's, it's interesting that you say that because I think our, as boomers, our children don't quite accept the fact that we are aging yet. You know, I had a very high bathroom ceiling that needed the light changed. And I didn't want to go on the ladder being here by myself. So I called my son and they thought that was ridiculous that I should call them to change a light bulb. <laughs> I said, yeah, but if I fall, it's going to be a whole lot worse. <laughs> so, the, the, I, you know, it's a, it's a transition for them to accept us as getting older too, I think. Sure. And, and, you know, we're in different generations and, and there's a lot of things different between our generation and theirs. And we're the boomer generation is, is we can do everything generation. And we've always done that and we can get it done. Um, you're, you're that other generation is I'll call someone to, <laughs> I'll do a fiver and I'll, I'll have a fiver come by and change my lights in my house. Um, and, and then not learn how to do it. And in yeah, necessity, yeah. they they may not ha know how to do it. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody, but I th I think you can relate to that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I think I think it goes both ways. Like we haven't completely accepted the fact that we're vulnerable. Also, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll say one on, one other thing that that I experienced in my my life and in my practice is that those people who were my age and and a little bit older, meaning they were born a little bit before me, um, had different experiences in life and had to be creative and had to solve problems. So problem solving for my staff members who were older than me was really great. 
And I don't think that exists as much today. Um, and my best example was we ordered a new refrigerator, small refrigerator for our um, sample cabinet in our office. And one of my nurses was changing the way the door opened, changed the hinge. Now, I didn't even know you could do that, but she got out the directions and changed the way the door opened so that oh, it wow. didn't block the swinging door uh, that we go into the room with. So, so there's a lot of ingenuity and creativity and problem solving that our generation had that I don't think exists after us. Not as much for sure. All right. So we did um, goals and we did roots. So now a is for attitude and I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm kind of relating that to roots because you you talked about it's only 25% of our health impact and our attitude towards our DNA is going to have a bigger impact, I would imagine. Correct. It does. And attitude gets talked about a lot. And I put three things as part of my attitude. It's attitude of of having a good attitude and being positive, having an attitude of gratitude, mm -hmm. and then having an attitude of kindness. So over the course of time, I've rolled those the three things together. But people talk a lot nowadays about gratitude, and it's incredibly important. And some of the physiologic things that happen in our bodies that help us live longer happen when we express gratitude. And my experiences with my patients um, who expressed gratitude was quite revealing to me. I had written a chapter in my book and it was going to be my only chapter that was kind of about me. It was about how I uh, diagnosed uh, someone's colon cancer and lung cancer and that it made a difference in their lives. And as I read more and understood it better, my patients, having gone through that, having an opportunity to express their gratitude to me became more important than what the chapter was about, that it was going to be about what I did. So I would watch one of my patients who I saw every quarter come to my office and thank me for finding his prostate cancer. To me, it was no big deal. Prostate cancer is fairly easy to detect. But I saw the expression on his face when he would tell me how grateful he was that he was still alive and he attributed it to me and, and that he got so much out of that. That hmm. was impressive to me. And I, I didn't understand it until this guy whose name is Jack started doing that. And, and then there were other people who did the same thing. And I reflected back on, on some of those people from earlier and realized that they got a great deal out of seeing me just for that purpose. The rest of my exam with them was fluff. Them coming in and having that opportunity uh, was important. And, and then there's this, this attitude of kindness that I think gets glossed over in our society. But being kind is just something that we're doing something for other people. But we get so much more out of being kind. It's like being generous and it, it's about being charitable. And that people will say, well, I'll give to you if you're good. But that kindness part is when you're kind to other people, you get something back in return that may be well beyond what you've given to other people. And, and I encourage people who are listening and watching to try that out because I think you'll find that that's true. Yeah, I think um, I think I call that um, the attitude of being of service too, you know, volunteering yeah. and those kinds of things. But did you have experience where the opposite happened. Like patients were so angry with you for a diagnosis and how that impacted their ability to recover or to not recover. Um, I'll pat myself on the back a little bit and say that I coached them well enough. Um, I provided them comfort in making a diagnosis and, and um, providing um, the information so that they understood. And I was always the person that talked about reality. So where other of the physicians may have been a little bit more aggressive of their care or dismissive in their care, I gave them the time to talk about those things to prevent that. 
Um, were there people that were angry about that? I can't think of any. There were some um, diagnoses that were um, challenging for people to understand how that happened. I was so good or I didn't do this. I didn't smoke, but um, they got a bad diagnosis and, and those were more difficult. In my book, You're Old, um, I wrote about one woman who in in the course of six months or less came up with four diagnoses and I didn't know which one was going to kill her first. Yeah. And um, I had more difficulty with the husband because he was a mean, ornery man. And I had to play act to and rehearse what I was going to say to them. But um, she took it all in stride pretty well um, and was very understanding as long as I laid everything out for her. And, and I think, you know, um, in, in this world of busy physicians and having to see a large number of patients and access to care being difficult, um, sometimes the diagnosis and the conversation gets glossed over. And I think people should make sure they're with the right person and the right doctor to get that information and ask for help. And even if it's not from the doctor per se, a social worker, a counselor who can help them deal with and address some anger issues that may be related to that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, particularly in the generation before us, were afraid to question their doctors, to ask questions. And it sounds like you were the kind of doctor that was straight with people. And if they wanted to ask you questions, you were there to give them answers. I'm so proud of the fact that I was, and I do relate to the fact that uh, people didn't ask many questions and, and they, they put physicians way up on some pedestal that they didn't think they were able to. Nowadays, we're lowered on the pedestal, but um, I would still sit down and say, look, you're not asking me enough questions. Let me give you a little bit more information about this. I want you to have some control over the situation because um, that's what anybody else would, would want. And um, mm -hmm. you may go and listen to another consultant talk to you about it. Please come back and talk to me because I'm afraid you may get uh, distracted and led down uh, a path that you, knowing you, you wouldn't want to be on. Well, and I also think, David, that when we're the patient, many of us are so distracted with all of the information that it's helpful to have somebody else there with us to also hear the information because it can be overwhelming sometimes. You, you are agree? so right. Yeah. And, and, and I experienced it in two different ways. One was early in my career when I was building my practice, I would meet with my accountant and we would meet quarterly. And I was so grateful for the fact that he had a legal sized piece of paper and he gave me one and a half sheets of written material and instructions uh, because I just wanted to know, how am I doing? How am I doing? And, and I was just, <laughs> had my focus on that. Meanwhile, you know, I had to pay this tax and this form and I had to make this deposit and I had to pay this bonus and whatever those things were. I couldn't capture the information he was telling me because uh, I was so flustered by all that information and, and this the, kind of the thought of, am I doing okay financially? Am I not? Um, and so uh, providing written information and having another person there to hear what someone else said was always really important. And I would encourage people to bring their spouses. Um, yeah. And and the flip side, if we, we ever dealt with Alzheimer's disease, I always mm -hmm. wanted some backup and someone to hear what I was saying um, so as not to um, give any mixed messages and that everybody heard the same thing and that they didn't go talk to this one and that one and, uh, and have different family members call me. I'd rather have them all in the room at the same time hearing the same presentation than someone hearing some nuance and something different. So yeah. it's a really good point. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. Now we've talked about GRA goals, roots, and attitude. The C is for companionship, right? Companionship. Correct. And talk to me about that. Well, um, when I wrote old, companionship to me was really important. 
And since that time, I've learned even greater information, but as it pertains to companionship, that's someone in your life that may be a spouse, it may be your children, it may be a friend or, or others, but, but the companion is that person who will do two things. Number one, will hear you cough or see that you're ill and say, you're ill, go to the doctor, I'm taking you now, We're not, I'm not taking no for an answer. That's what companions do. But the other thing is that interaction, that relationship, the, the, the uh, uh, stress reduction component of having a loved one. And, and research is really pretty clear that people who, who are in relationships and are married live longer than people who don't. So that there's a longevity factor along with that. But, but that companionship is important. And if it's an intimate relationship, that's incredibly important. And I talk in my other book about, you know, five levels of companionship, but, but it would be, you know, your intimate relationship, your family, your BFS, some people you know from a club that you belong to, and, and then in the community, they all contribute to your well-being. And um, the opposite of intimacy is loneliness. And loneliness is a health hazard. And we can't gloss over the fact that baby boomers are part of a component of our society who become lonely. They become detached. They lose a spouse. They move away. They move with their kids. They move to a kid's city uh, and, and they lose their friends in, in a snap. And so um, they retreat. Men in particular are not joiners of groups. They, they stay to themselves partly because that was their upbringing, partly because that was their job. We, even for myself, I worked in a silo as a doctor. It was like me and the patient, me and the next patient. My, I, I tried to interact with my staff. I tried to interact with people in the hospital, but, but it's mainly a one person show so that I was not as attuned to doing that. And now that I am, it's like, I'll recommend to people to learn a new hobby like photography or, or join a chess club or a bowling group or a golf club or tennis, do things that will put you in a situation where you will develop friends and companions and people you can do things with. Uh, because 24 hours a day, by yourself or 24 hours a day looking at television or 24 hours a day with one person, your spouse um, may not suffice. Yeah. So if I was your patient, you'd probably tell me <laughs> I spend too much time by myself um, and I'm too fiercely independent, but I do join, you know, I am a member of a couple of organizations and I do have several girlfriends that I get out with, but yeah, nobody's here telling me if I'm coughing, I'm taking you to the doctor. <laughs> oh, your friends, your friends would. They'd hear your cough on the phone. But it, but it, it just like any of the things I talk about in the in in our conversation today, they require intention. And they so, require intention. Um, you're connecting with people, and you're getting a lot back from doing these podcasts and, totally. and you're connecting with people and they're connecting with you. So don't beat yourself up about it. No. Uh, and in fact, I even saw somebody uh, in comments today that Mary Beth, she says, um, she, if I need help because of my finger, just to give her a call. So thank you, Mary Beth. <laughs> they are there for me. I know, I know. <laughs> and, 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 and it's, um, it's been an interesting and enjoyable experience for me in retirement um, to connect with people and say, let's go have coffee. Let's go have lunch. People that I've known in my community for a long time, but they worked and I worked. And uh, one is a new person who moved, who's moved in recently. And, and one was an old guy who I, who I met up with when I was doing part of a bicycle club. And we became friends until he moved to San Diego. So, so there's, there are people that I've gone after. And I tell them, I'll say, this is about me and my health. Because my health will be better if I have companionship. And, and so will yours. And if we hit it off and, you know, we're going to get together um, every couple of weeks and have coffee and talk about life and talk about our, our childhood, if that was it. One of the guys, um, his family was in the same business as my dad. So we really had something to relate to. Politically, we're different, but we were able to relate to some of those family things that we did. And we always have things to talk about. What a fun way to approach somebody. Uh, this is good for my health and yours too. Let's be friends. <laughs> exactly what I did. 
All right, so we're down to E. E is for your environment. How does your environment impact your longevity and your health and fulfillment in life? Well, I, I talk about environment in a couple different ways. When I speak in front of an audience, I put up a slide of of a lush garden and then I and a, and a stream. And it also has a picture of some smokestacks in a city putting out pollution. So it's it's that part outside of us. And and I talk about the importance of being with nature. And I'm lucky enough that there's some gardens in my yard. And I make sure to go out in my garden every day and look at my amaryllis, a, a, a bulb my mom gave me about 10 years ago. And, and I've propagated it. Now it's all over my garden. And I'm really proud Aww. of the, the pink flowers that pop up around um, sometime in April every year. I only yeah. see them for a few weeks, but, but being out there, I put feed in my bird feeder just so I can see that nature is around us and it gives a calming um, effect to our bodies. And then the other part is the environment inside of us, what we put in our bodies and how we take care of this, this temple of ours that's just so important. And it did uh, uh, motivate me to write my second book, The Power of Five. Uh, so there, are, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the fact that there are five things in that environment that we have control over. So what we do with our body and how we take care of us ourselves um, is incredibly important. And that's something we have control over. So I thought you were going to say it's not just the food we put in our bodies, but it's the thoughts we put in our heads, too, and how we sometimes have to reframe that if we're thinking negative thoughts. It goes back to attitude, I guess. It, it gets back to attitude. And, and so, you know, it's my five S's are sweet, sugar, carbohydrates, uh, processed foods, unhealthy foods, eating too much, being addicted to sweets. That, that's one of them. Um, sweat, which is exercise, how much exercise we do. And it doesn't take much. It's 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Or I just read an article very recently that you can consolidate it all to a weekend and get okay. your 150 minutes in on a weekend might be satisfactory. Certainly 450 minutes a week is, is sort of the optimal beyond that. You don't get much more benefit. Mm. Um, and when you talked about you know, what you have control over, you have control over your thoughts. And so that's the stress mindfulness component of how we can take care of ourselves and make ourselves healthier. And um, it does the chemical things in our body to reduce inflammation. This is the meditation part and the self-talk part that you do the meditation, you do the mindfulness, you talk to yourself and, and you'll lower your stress levels, lower your cortisol levels or improve your release of endorphins. Um, and you'll have a better outlook. And there's a lot of mental talk with that, with that too, but, but it's incredibly important. And we have control over that. Um, and that has an impact on our health and our longevity. And people who are less stressed have less illness. It's been proven in article after article and study after study so that there's a lot of literature that supports that. Um, in our growing up as baby boomers, I think it was poo-pooed uh, quite a bit. And uh, we thought it was uh, just a little too much spirituality. But um, it's been found to be beneficial. And um, now that we have a little bit more time on our hands, um, to learn how to do some of the meditation stuff that people talk about can be really beneficial. I was listening to a podcast about it today that we do have control over. It really does make a difference. Yeah, I think you're right that it really does make a difference. And um, I'm wondering of all of these things, you know, your, your five S's, grace, if we're at a point now, like a few weeks from now, I'll be 70. And I think I've been living a healthy life, but <laughs> thank you. But if there was one thing that you wanted to say to me, like, Wendy, this is the thing you really should focus on for the next, you know, because changing habits are hard. What would be that one thing that we think would have the biggest impact on my health? Well, probably would figure which one of those S's you had the greatest deficiency in and, mm -hmm. and focus on that. Um, 
I, at the moment I retired, I didn't think my stress levels were high, but, but they were high enough. I, I knew that, and, and there's certain things that happen in, in, in the world and in medicine that bother me and, and disturb me. Um, and I had a great relationship and yeah, maybe I was lacking on friends, but you heard what I said about what I'm doing about that. Mm -hmm. um, I had difficulty with sleep. So mm -hmm. that was, that was my sort of Achilles heel that for 40 okay. years of practicing, either there was a rotary dial phone or a touchstone phone or, or <laughs> one of these uh, next to my bed and it could ring at any time yeah. and it disrupted my sleep and I wasn't getting as much sleep. I'm a night owl in a in a job that required me to be up earlier in the day than I wanted to be, and yeah. so um, there were some limitations in my sleep. And I set some goals of of enhancing that and doing a better job. And it's taken two or three years for me to get to that point. But but that was what I would say is the one area for me that was weak. But everybody has their their weakness. And um, I know my wife and I were in a store. Um, about a month ago, and the woman be who was helping us was was overweight. That's being generous and kind. And we talked about what we do that we write. And my wife publishes a cookbook, a healthy eating cookbook, and and I talk about avoiding sweets and and and, and processed foods. And she said, "Oh, but I'm addicted to sweets." I was like okay, well, you wouldn't know which one of those S's that you really need to approach and don't rely on the fact that you're addicted to sugar and the addiction to sugar, processed foods, uh, carbohydrates is similar to addiction to drugs and sex and exercise and alcohol. Uh, it all, they all seem to have an effect on your dopamine levels in your brain and you get a real experience, um, a, a pleasure sensation from those things. And, and that's dopamine. And the opposite, the other uh, emotion a person can have is happiness. So, Wendy, I'd say, you know, my interaction with you, you're a pretty happy person. And happiness is a serotonin chemical that makes you happy. So mm -hmm. you can do things that make you happy and you release your serotonin. But if you do things that release dopamine, you're doing it for pleasure. And so this woman couldn't break her habit of needing to get pleasure from eating sugar and sugar. sweet foods. And Which so is bad for her health. Yeah. And, and, and my wife and I put together a journal to, uh, support the power of five. So I know that every day I wake up, I look at my Pentagon and, and I make sure that I'm able to put a check mark next to each one of my five S's, which means I work on my eating. I work on my exercise. I look at how much sleep I got and try to make it better. I work on my stress. I work on, um, and my relationship and companionship with my wife. So, so those are things that we can all kind of adapt in a big way or a little way and just do it a little bit at a time. And as you mentioned, Wendy, pick on one and, and start from there. And I'm if from you're there. 70, you know, 70, I'm making this up a little bit. It's the new 40, you know, <laughs> if you're, if you're healthy other than your finger at, at age 70, and then you 70 is the new 70 is what I like to say, you know, oh. because we used to think 70 was old and 70 is still, we're still going strong. We're still creating new things you're like right. you, you retired three years ago and look at you, you're not really retired. Right. <laughs> you're still going strong. But, but if you, if, if, if anybody in your audience is 70 and they're healthy, their life expectancy like yours is at least 20 years. You're going to live as long or longer than my 93-year-old mother-in-law, and you may even eclipse my Aunt Flo, who, who lived to be 102. Um, and there's lots of data to support everything that I talk about, and there's my scientific discoveries looking at some of the, the cellular level of things that, are, that go on that we'll all be adapting to our lives. But for what we can do now it's my power of five my five s's and and those things have an impact on mitochondria now i'm getting into the weeds for your audience yeah 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 and but, we're gonna... but but there are things that uh, science is showing us where we can where we can make a difference in our lives and the whole idea 
is to have a long health span. Lifespan is not really great if you're disabled from the age of 70, to, but you live to be 90. You want to be like you and me, and vibrant and healthy and doing all the things we want exactly. to do up until exactly. our last breath. Right. So, so follow the grace formula of setting goals, taking care of your DNA, having a positive attitude, intentionally building companionship and having a healthy environment internally and externally. And then look at David's power of five book, which we haven't, um, we don't have behind you, but um, it is also a book about, you know, the five S's that are important in life that he was mentioning stress and sleep and exercise, which is not an S. I like my little Pentagon that I have up there. <laughs> sweat, sweat, sweet, sex, stress, and sleep. There you go. Thank you. All right. So thank you, David. You um, gave us a lot of good information, and I really appreciate it. If people wanted to email you with any additional follow-up questions, they can reach out to you at david at of 5 the number 5, life.com, or they can go to your website, powerof5life.com. I will put both of those into the show notes. Um, I also want to remind you about Road Scholar. Check out roadscholar.org slash heyboomer when you are planning your next trip. And check out our vitality assessment on heyboomer.biz. We talked a lot about living a fully vital and healthy life. So see where you're at. This is more about um, emotionally where you're at but it's on heyboomer.biz. Next week. Next week, uh, my guest has definitely redefined re retirement. Her name is Melissa Davies, and she had a big corporate career working in the managed care, you know, an executive in managed care. And at 65, she asked herself, is this what I want to do for the next X number of years? And her answer was no she decided that she wanted to be a filmmaker. She had never been a filmmaker, right? So she made a film. Um, it was called Beyond 60. She's now working on her next film, but Beyond 60 is about women over the age of 60. And it was, um, it's available, um, you know, for general consumption. And it's a, it's a fascinating, very brave story. So be sure and join us next week for that. And I like to leave you all with the belief that we can live with curiosity, live with relevance and live with courage. And remember that you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. Thanks so much, David. Thank you, enjoyed it, Wendy. My name is Wendy Green and this has been Hey Boomer. Are you a crafter? Annie's Kit Clubs will deliver creativity right to your mailbox. Get a new shipment every month with supplies and instructions to make something beautiful. Whether you like crocheting, quilting, knitting, or other crafts, Annie's has a club for you. They even offer clubs to try a variety of crafting techniques. Make a quick new project every month or take a larger piece like a quilt or an afghan one section at a time. Annie's has clubs for kids too. So introduce your kids to crafting, woodworking, and STEM activities with projects they can make themselves. No matter your age, skill level, or crafting interest, you can explore your favorite hobbies with convenient kits that are just the right size. Visit Annie's Kit Clubs, that's A-N-N-I-E-S, K-I-T, Clubs, C-L-U-B-S, dot com, and enter promo code BOOMER at checkout to receive 50% off your first order. Begin crafting today.